All right, folks, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here in just a second. Um, got a, a busy day here in the uh, Pasco County Extension Office, so lots of phones ringing off the hook. If that happens, I apologize. I will send it over to voicemail just as quickly as I can. Um, but uh, before we get started, I, I'm kind of waiting on quite a few more people, I think, yet to come in, and, and I might kind of stop a few times just to allow them into the meeting. So please excuse me if I have to stop and, and stutter for just a second to, to make sure we get them um, logged in safely. Um, just want to let everybody know um, that we are recording this afternoon. Um, and I do have currently everybody muted and I do have your screens off just for everybody's viewing pleasure. Um, at the end of the session, I will unmute your microphone. So if you've got any questions throughout, please write those down. I really want to be able to communicate with you and talk with you and answer any questions um, and give you all a platform if you so desire to, to talk about some of these topics. So just hang tight with me. Um, in this day and age with uh, the Zoom bombings and whatnot, we want to be as careful as we can. So. Um, while staying as interactive as we possibly can at the same time. So please bear with me. And again, if anybody's knocking on my office door, if you've seen in the news lately, some of the uh, suspicious seeds that uh, came in from uh, China recently, the extension offices are now a drop-off point for opened packages. So um, we've got quite a few people coming in today and dropping off seeds with some concern. So we're definitely taking care of them today as well. So. If you hear a little bit of commotion, that's what's going on in the background. But um, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's just about five after two. I, I do want to say just how excited I am to have you all with me today. I recognize some names on here, um, some folks that are planners, some folks that are extension agents, some of my, my colleagues in various departments around um, the area. Excited to have you with me to discuss what has become, I think, a very timely topic. It's always been a very important topic, but I don't think um, folks really realize just how important that community gardens were. And I think they're definitely taken for granted. And I'm gonna walk you through some of my experiences today um, and also get over here. Let me let a couple more folks in. Get over here and talk about our objectives then Talk about, first of all, some of the things that I, I have a feeling if you're on here, you already understand at least some of the benefits of community gardens in our communities. I want to talk a little bit without going down a, a dark road right now. We've all got enough darkness to deal with. But in a positive light, talk about some of the experiences that I've had surrounding community gardens in other parts of the world and how that really was an impetus for what we've done here in Pasco County. So I want to talk about survival from a community garden standpoint, wrap that into what's been going on with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, right now we're seeing a, a surge of folks that are wanting to get more self-sufficient, that are wanting to garden on their own property, but also we recognize that a lot of folks don't have those um, spaces to be able to do that and they don't necessarily have the knowledge. So extension is really coming in and being able to fill that gap, make folks feel a lot more comfortable with what's going on, feel a little bit more secure from a food standpoint. And we're providing them opportunities to be able to grow their learn and to grow their own and be able to learn how to do even more. Um, then I want to talk about, I think probably the biggest and most easily overlooked aspect of community gardens, and that is in empowerment. I know for folks that are in extension that we're always concerned with empowering um, our clientele and our audience in multiple ways. And I do believe this to be the case also for folks that are in planning and in development. It's all about moving our communities forward and making them safer and better places, healthier environments for everybody across the spectrum. So, I think there's definitely going to be something for absolutely everybody here. I, I feel like that there are going to be things that especially folks in planning and development can take away as opportunities as well here today so um, that we can move forward in, in not just how we are 
gardening in the communities, um, but looking at our local food systems as well, and really trying to help empower our communities and bringing them into these discussions and into the fold. You all know as short range or long range planners, how important it is to get community support and backing for any kind of program, but we really do need them involved, not just in the support, but in the actual design. And we need the needs assessments. We need to hear from them and, and be able to design for them and around them and with them. So let's go ahead and move very slowly maybe over into some of these benefits. And again, I think most everybody understands that community gardens can be a really excellent source of healthy foods that you're growing yourself. Um, for some folks, this provides a level of nutrition security. We have um, many segments of our population that are food insecure. And I have encountered a lot of people just in the last couple of years in our community gardens program that really their access to healthy fruits and vegetables, especially those that find themselves in food deserts, more in disadvantaged areas, less likely to be able to travel very far from home. They're really relying on what they're growing themselves for that fresh food. And this is really an issue of nutrition and security. Um, it's not just about supplementing, it really becomes a, a major component of their nutrition. Luckily with our community gardens, we don't just use them as places to grow fruits and vegetables, we use them as teaching spaces as well. And we come in and we talk about, you know, things as simple as how to grow herbs and how to cook with herbs, how to garden and then cook on a budget. But we're also looking at the nutritional aspect of this for children, teens, adults, and our older adults in our population as well. So community gardens open up a much broader aspect of our community and education than just the gardening aspects. That's just one small piece of a community garden. And I would argue possibly the smallest um, component and the least important component, sounds odd I know, to what we're doing with community gardens. Um, they're obviously a really good place for physical activity and recreation. Also, those educational opportunities. I mean, we can teach things as simple as, you know, good bugs and bad bugs. What are good bugs and bad bugs? And when do you need pesticides? And when do you not? And how to fertilize and how to irrigate appropriately. These are educational outdoor classrooms. So providing all kinds of opportunities to not just talk about horticulture, and food safety and nutrition, but we can also talk art and we can do writing and, and youth development, um, math projects um, out in these um, community gardens. And we have some 4-H um, uh, participants that use them for part of their projects every year as well. So it's a very broad educational opportunity. There's also some potential income for some folks um, to develop co-ops, um, market gardens where they are producing value added products. They might be growing their own, using some of those things at home, canning them and preserving them for their own purposes, but things that they have extra, or if they wanted to use these spaces to start their own business, basically, they can start a cottage food industry. Um, and we do have folks that might grow something like cucumbers. We teach them how to pickle those cucumbers um, and um, we even provided for a commercial kitchen space, a kitchen incubator here in Pasco County that we operate in coordination with Pasco Economic Development Council to give folks the information about the food safety, the preparation. We can take them from how to grow it, where to grow it, how to process it, how to market it, and how to sell it and get it out into the community. And we have folks that are making thousands of dollars off of what they're producing just with the education and the spaces that we're able to afford them starting with community gardens. So there's a lot more potential here than just growing a handful of fruits and vegetables to have on hand around the house. We also find that it does cut down on the grocery bill. And this is critical for a lot of people. And we're really seeing that become much more of an integral part of family budgeting at this point in time with the pandemic. We 
In our community gardens, we operate about eight right now, two new ones that we are partnering to develop across the county. We tend to aim more toward low income communities, but we have them all over the county and we have need and we have want and we have desire. Um, regardless of our economic community and situation, but we find people that are using um, these community gardens in a wide variety of ways to not only supplement what's on the table um, in a more healthy way, but they're also able to provide some money for their family after losing some jobs um, due to the pandemic. So again, this is a, a terrific avenue and vehicle for many more programs than most people could ever imagine. And again, the horticultural aspect is critical and important, but it really becomes secondary to some of the more empowering aspects of our programs. I did want to talk just a little bit about some of the impetus behind what we do here in Pasco County and leave you today with really a success story here in Pasco that I think can be repeated and used in a lot of ways, um, regardless of the community that you might be working in. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Rwanda and Uganda. Now, if you know anything about this area, um, Rwanda only about 25, 26 years ago, um, about a million people were murdered during a genocide. Um, it was obviously a very difficult time for that nation and all of the nations that surrounded um, Rwanda, like Uganda, they took in a lot of refugees. Some of those refugees um, actually committed were perpetrators of crime. Some of those were fleeing for their life. Visiting this area that is just 25 years out from a genocide is an incredibly emotional journey as you could probably imagine. Eye-opening in so many ways. And if you've been to this region of Africa or, or any other area where you have third world nations in many cases, you will find people living basically in shacks. Now, not to say that right down the road from my office, I don't have the same thing occurring. And that's what really made our program so relevant. I saw the parallels between what I saw in Africa, obviously much more significant there, but I could see the parallels of what many people were dealing with here, just in our same communities right down the street from us. And in some parts of, of, of Rwanda where I was at, the majority of it, and especially Uganda, there were basically three jobs. You could raise bananas and you would raise those to feed your family and that would be the majority of your food source. Um, and what you didn't eat, you would try to sell. The other option was to dig and break rocks to sell, to try to build homes. And you can see some of these very modest, these were some of the nicer homes in the picture there at the top left on your screen. Or you could build and sell coffins. So that just gives you a glimpse into the everyday life that the individuals in this particular region live. This is their reality. Fortunately for the majority of us, we are far removed from this. But when you see it and you walk it and you talk with these individuals, you, you have the opportunity to learn really what the most basic needs are of human beings. And you are reminded of the fact that we still have those needs here even though we have untold privileges to do more. Um, there are throughout this area, a lot of tea plantations, some banana plantations. The majority of folks though that own these are from other nations, very rich. Um, there are some workers obviously um, that are harvesting and planting in these fields, but the majority of the work here is incredibly, incredibly difficult and backbreaking. Now, when you think about this, you know, either you're building coffins, you're breaking rocks, or you're just collecting and harvesting bananas, hopefully to sell a few and feed your family, you could imagine that you would not have any sort of level of empowerment. You could almost imagine 
life draining out of the world around you. This is a hard life, don't get me wrong. However, I was fortunate enough to go into many villages to where they have basically community gardens like you see in the bottom right hand picture. These community gardens is where everybody in the community from the, the young to the old are working collectively to grow crops for their particular little village. Um, sometimes this might be a handful of people, it might be a few dozen people, but I can't tell you how many places I went where everybody was smiling as they were working these gardens. And they were taking some of these products and you can see some of the ladies there working, sewing, taking some of these products and they were putting these products to use outside of their home and making value added products. Some of them were growing coffee and producing coffee and had their own small coffee shops off the side of the road. And you see then this entrepreneurial spirit coming out of these people that have been so oppressed and every day is a fight for survival, but they were happy. They had smiles on their faces and they were not just surviving, but they were thriving in a very difficult environment. And that was because they were anchored to each other and they were anchored to their communities by a community garden that was thriving and had life in it. And it gave them life. And in talking with these individuals about their experience, walking through their gardens with them, the pride that they had in these gardens, it gave them a sense of belonging, number one. It gave them a sense of community, number two, which is, so critical, especially when your community has been shredded by war and by genocide so recently. Um, but it also gave them a level of empowerment. People that have no money, people that have no education for the most part, that want to go to school, but there are no schools or they're not permitted because they're a refugee in some cases and they basically have no home country. They're not able to get any education. These are not wealthy people in money, but these are wealthy people in spirit anchored by their community gardens. And they protect them very fiercely um, and, and they, they have such pride. And to me, that brought me back to these places that again, right up the road from my office, from my home, where people are living in shacks. They don't have a sense of belonging. They don't have a sense of community. They are not empowered in any way. If you can have just a piece of empowerment over your food, I mean, food is our most basic necessity, food, water, shelter. These people have control over their food to some extent at least, and this gives them hope and that sense of belonging. And it moves them forward in terms of hope for a better day and empowered to start their own businesses and, and to better their communities and to share. And it was a story of hope. When you first arrive in this area, it does not feel that way. It's not what you see, but when you look deeper and you talk to people out in these gardens, this, this is what you get. And I could see how not only could community gardens back here in the United States where we have so much more privilege and opportunity help those that want the recreation and the activity and want to grow their own basically as a hobby when they have no problem going to the grocery store and buying what they wish, but all the way down to those folks that are just trying to survive. And it's not just going to allow them to survive, it's going to allow them to thrive. It will give them opportunity, which is what is lacking in so many of our communities. So here in Pasco County, I brought back um, what I learned. I, you know, I have the horticultural um, knowledge under my belt. belt. I am the horticulture agent here in Pasco County. I'm the County Extension Director for the University of Florida. This is what I do. I can teach you how to grow this stuff. But what I had to do was build a coalition of people that also saw this same vision, find the properties, be able to pay for the water, be able to pay for the plants, get buy-in and support 
from our Board of County Commissioners, um, from city and uh, municipalities in some cases, and many different organizations to see the same opportunities. It's not just about growing the fruits and the vegetables. It's not just about the classes that we can offer on budgeting and food safety and nutrition. It's not just about that. It's about empowering these communities. And so you can see here just a, a few of the photos of some of our gardens here in Pasco County. We have agreements, interlocal agreements with um, municipalities, some of our municipalities in the county um, and the University of Florida and with some of our organizations um, like Vincent's Academy that's going in um, over in the Hudson area. So we're pretty much working with as many organizations as we can to get the land then we come in and we teach folks how to grow it, how to develop it, how to keep it going, how to troubleshoot it. And we find folks like the family here on the, the right hand side, this particular family, it's a family of three. The, um, we actually have a community garden at a low income housing unit. And um, this particular family um, really was not eating anything other than processed foods from a local convenience store. They didn't have much opportunity to leave the area. It's quite rural, definitely a food desert. We came in and in just a few raised beds taught them how to grow their own. And before you know it, the kids, the mother reported saying that the kids hardly wouldn't eat a meal if there was not vegetables in it that they had grown themselves. You know, and this is what they began to ask for. And we also found this mother feeling empowered. She was having some level of control over food, which is the basic aspect and need of a human being. And she started to see that, well, I can have some control over this aspect of my family's life. Well, what about the budgeting aspect? And what about getting some job skills? And you know, all, and what about our health? All of these kinds of things that then we could connect them with. And if it wasn't a service that we offered, our networking is vast through University of Florida Extension. We could tie them in with those networking opportunities and we were able to get this, this single mother a job and get her transportation then um, back and forth to that job. So out of a community garden grew health, grew nutrition, grew physical activity, grew recreation, but also grew belonging and grew community and grew opportunity. And this is exactly what a community garden can and should be um, utilized for and can be in any community um, across, across our state and really the nation. You know, there's, there's definitely this, this relationship here of the, the golden principle, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Simon Sinek, um, and he talks about you know how Apple is such a successful organization. It's not about what they do, and it's not about how they do it. We're, we're familiar with their products. We're familiar with you know how they network. The reason they're so incredibly successful is they talk about and they sell the why of their product and of their company. It really is about the why with community gardening. And I think from a planning and development standpoint, that is one of the most critical aspects. You could talk all day about how you do what you do and what you do, but it's the why that's going to sell it. It's the why that's gonna get the buy-in. It's the why that's gonna get the financial support. It's the why that's going to make a change and have an impact to better our communities. This is this concept of the, the golden circle. The why for a community garden is to foster community and provide a sense of belonging and opportunity. It's to provide and build connections. Obviously it can promote healthier lifestyles, but really and truly it's empowering citizens. And what I found from my work with community gardens my work and, and travels throughout the world, not just Africa, is empowered eating out of these gardens equals empowered communities. When you have some small level of control, when the rest of the world is out of control, 
that is a process of empowerment and that fuels a need and it fuels a desire for education. And I think all of us on here understand that education is how we can lift ourselves out of a lot of disparity and find those opportunities and get a foothold in some way or another. So, you know, I could talk all day long about the horticultural aspects and I could, I could nerd out on the, the bugs and the plants and whatnot, but it would defeat the purpose, to be quite honest with you, of, from my opinion, about the vision, the mission, the necessity, and the benefit of a community garden. It's about building community and making it better. This is what we do in Extension. This is what planners do as well. Now, this goes a little bit deeper, obviously. The last, uh, oh my gosh, seven months or so, um, we've been dealing, obviously, with a very serious situation, a pandemic. That has obviously had an impact on educational opportunities. It has had an impact. I think most people would argue negative impact on most of our communities um, in many different ways. And it has created a lot of talk about resiliency. And I think some people tend to get wrapped up in that word resiliency and they start talking sustainability and all this kind of stuff. And they, they start to, to confuse some terms. Resiliency is anything from, you know, being able to, to build homes that can withstand and not be impacted by sea level rise um, all the way over to when you have an economic disaster, how well can that community pull together, lift each other up, stay strong, lose as few jobs as possible and build others in other places. I have found that community gardens have weathered this storm of a pandemic tremendously well. They are a model for resiliency. They are a model for the backbone of our local food systems, which have many different dimensions throughout that food chain all the way from production, all the way over to the folks that drive the trucks on the road and deliver it, and the people that are cooking it, processing it, and even the people that handle the food waste. Community gardens can be a backbone for our local food systems. What we learned, and I think what the majority of the public has learned, and I'm telling you the first month or two of the pandemic, my phone rang off the hook of citizens wanting to know more about how to grow their own. Many of them at home had some opportunity and they might have a small patio and we talked about container gardening. That's not gonna obviously supply all the food that you need, but I had a lot of folks saying, I have lost a job. I'm scared I'm gonna lose a job. I am disassociated from my community now and I am depressed and I am down and I am scared and I am fearful. The one thing I could do was say, let me give you a free plot in a community garden. You come out, we're gonna teach you how to grow it. We're even gonna supply some, some plants for you, get you going. We're gonna help you with this. We're gonna kind of oversee this process. We can be distanced, we can wear masks, we can be safe out here together. Our community gardens folks, we've got two program assistants in Pasco County. That's how important the county sees our program is being, they support two program assistants in the county and they were considered essential workers because this involves food. They stayed on the job. They worked with individuals. We've not had one uh, plot free for months and we have started to see families saying, you know what, we've got some extra in our plot. Where can this be donated for other families? We started having people say, I don't need my whole plot, split my plot and give the other half to another family. We started to see those connections and that community and that belonging coming together, becoming resilient. And folks had a sense of security, even though it was small, had a sense of security over something they could control as small as being able to grow some tomatoes and some peppers and some cucumbers and whatnot, even some blueberries in some cases, it helped them to feel more comfortable in a relatively scary situation, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Community gardens are not just for skilled gardeners. They're for absolutely everybody. These are learning opportunities. 
if you fail at it and everything dies, you know, you learn from it and you start over again type situation. There are tons of opportunities to start gardens. They don't have to be large. They can be very small scale. I think right now we have a lot of people in the community. I've had people that have called and just asked to volunteer in our community gardens because they feel like they need to be giving something they are lacking in that um, communication with other people being isolated. This allows them in a safe outdoor environment to be able to get some recreation, to get some healthy activity and some exposure to other people and feel like they're helping. Um, lots of opportunities then to volunteer. I have some people that are not even growing their own foods in the gardens. They just want to volunteer to be helping during a very difficult time. But these community gardens during the pandemic has been a great opportunity to for us to be able to contribute to building stronger, more resilient neighborhoods and individuals. And I can tell you that there is more need. We are not filling the need of the calls that keep coming every day. It is a process to develop a community garden. There are agreements that are necessary. There are, there are um, commitments to be made. There are considerations to be had over location and safety factors and size and you know who's gonna pay for the water, but none of these things cannot be overcome when a community comes together. And we have really seen the impact in this program that was almost three years old already. Um, and it's been forced to the forefront here in Pasco County. And we've had, you know, a lot of opportunities for um, interviews um, and, and a lot of people that are very interested in what we've been doing and looking to model it and grow it and expand it for more resilient communities. So there's a really good opportunity, I think, here for planning and, and development folks that, that, that are planners. Because again, remember, there's a lot of creativity that's involved with community gardens and it's not just about the growing of the fruits or vegetables. There's great opportunities for placemaking here. Um, taking areas that are maybe run down, um, maybe not very pretty, and beautification projects that can be done in community gardens. I'm going to go over in just a second a little bit of detail about one of our major success stories um, here in Pasco County that involves all of what you see here, these opportunities. Lots of opportunity for recreation, lots of opportunity for education, not just from the Extension Office, but also in what planning and development is all about and what it does. You know, um, I have family that's in planning and development. I do understand it, I'm somewhat intimately associated with it, but just like extension is hard to really explain to people who we are and what we do, I get the sense that planning is very much the same way. Um, I, I suspect some of you have probably been asked, what do you do? And, you know, just to say I plan is not sufficient. That's not gonna work. What does that really mean, right? And these community gardens um, give planners an opportunity to explain and not just tell, but show what they can do with placemaking and opportunities within their community and the connections and networking opportunities with other departments in your communities too. There's a lot of opportunity here for resiliency planning, not just around local food systems, but also stormwater runoff, um, you know, sea level rise in some cases. We do have climate change that is occurring and these spaces are good opportunities for educational opportunities here to teach the public about what's going on, but then how to plan for resiliency at the same time. It's also a great place to bring children into the fold to start to explain to them what planning is about. It's not just about what's going on now, but us looking 10, 15, 20, 50 years down the road and trying to build out these communities in a safe way, a healthy way that benefits everybody in some way. So, you know, how do we help, you know, from a planning standpoint of creating more resilient communities? It's about creating these kind of spaces, not just the buildings, not just the roadways. 
not just a little bit of landscaping here or there, but a very highly functional, um, highly adaptable, flexible, and creative space. And this is also then about creating those healthy lifestyles. And I know for a fact that planners are very much invested um, and committed to building healthy lifestyle, safe environments um, for the citizens that they serve. And community gardens are excellent opportunities for planning and development to get involved in all of these aspects. So here in Pasco County uh, last year, um, I actually um, started working with our Pasco Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources Department on a space behind a local community center in Land Lakes. It was really devoid. There was just grass back there, not very pretty, nothing going on. There was this horrible gray retention wall that separated this green space basically behind the community center from a parking lot. And it was really just not very pretty, first of all, and it was not functional, but it was a nice large space. And I came in and asked our Parks and Rec Director, Keith Wiley, if we would be able to partner and use that space to build a community garden. And Keith is one of those folks that if he thinks it can happen, he's going to try his best to make it happen. And he said, what do you need? We started working together collaboratively. I do have some donors in the community that provide us with some funds on occasion to help with things like organic matter. I mean, we've got sand. You can't grow vegetables in sand very well. So we were able to add in organic matter, brought in our program assistants, which are fantastic from a horticultural sense. We, we built these raised beds. We utilized volunteers to do it. And this gray wall is staring back here at me. And um, some of you know Amy Elmore, um, that at the time was with Pasco Planning and Development. And um, we got to talking about this, this terrible gray wall and how beautiful the garden was, popping with color. And she said, this would be a fantastic place-making opportunity. And from there, you can see on this picture how this gray wall became this beautiful blue painted wall that frames this community garden now. And you had University of Florida Pasco Extension Office coming in with the expertise on the horticultural and educational side, Pasco Parks, Rec, and Natural Resources with the space and taking care of the water, funding the water that it takes to, to grow our fruits and veggies, and Pasco Planning and Development that came in and said, let's do an art contest here. Let's talk about food for all. And that was the theme of this particular art contest. And they reached out into the community. They had children to submit art. And the art that you see on this wall was actually some of the, the winning art projects coming in from the children. We actually partnered with the Autism Society with Florida through planning and development and their connections to offer this project for children with autism somewhere on that spectrum. And so they, they did a fantastic job, so creative with the, the artwork that they turned in with the uh, surrounding this food, of, uh, food for all theme. Planning and development, Amy was able to, with I believe an intern she had, um, find a local artist that came in for free. Again, this is about beautification with the garden and this wall, it's about placemaking and community development. That artist came in for free and transposed that artwork onto this wall. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And we had an open house um, back in February this year where we unveiled the new garden. We had the president of the Autism Society of Florida come. We gave awards to some of the kids um, for their artwork. We were able to showcase the garden. Everybody could see all of those benefits that we talked about, but we were able to demonstrate the power that a community garden can have. We had children that had never tried a strawberry, for example. And in a safe, engaging, comfortable environment, something they would never have touched at home or anywhere else, they tried a strawberry. Now you might not think that's, that's big, but if you know a child that's on the autism spectrum, you can realize how new experiences can be difficult and can be scary. 
this transformed the life of many of these children in a matter of hours. And now they have blossomed and grown beyond where they were at that time to be able to try new things and it not be as scary. They have reached out and through this process, we had well over a hundred people that came from all different segments of the community. We had local legislators that came that just showed up um, actually and asked to speak on the importance of this particular space. We had um, Board of County Commissioners show up that wanted to speak. Uh, you know, it, it was just one of the most um, rewarding things I've ever done in my career. First of all, because of the space we were able to create, but because we were able to empower families. We have families growing their own food. We have families learning. We have families that have children that are nonverbal, that are stretching beyond what seemed like boundaries in these spaces. We've been able since then to teach a uh, gardening with autism um, six week course um, that was just a phenomenal, phenomenally uh, rewarding experience for everybody involved out of just a small community garden. We've been able to give people some level of control, not just over food, but even over what some would see as disabilities or just different ways of doing things. They were able to find some level of control over that and that changes communities, that empowers communities. This would not have been possible. Could we have had a small garden there? Absolutely. But this huge success would not have been possible without the networking and the partnerships with planning and development and with parks, recreation, and natural resources. Um, you know, this, I, I can't really explain how exciting it is even today to drive by just on the road. And this garden, which is behind a building, pops from the side of the road and that wall and how much of a difference that that has made. This, this was an empowerment, a movement, a place making that brought this community together. And I still get calls about this all the time, wanting us to do this in other areas. And I think for planning and development, there's a huge opportunity here to work with other departments like extension or uh, parks, um, you know, utilities, all kinds of different folks to make huge impacts in their communities. So from a, a planning standpoint then, some things that I would suggest and some tips that I would offer to you is to reach out to your local University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences Extension Office. They're in, we're in every county. Um, we can help even if we're not involved with anchoring the program like we are in Pasco County, we can help with the expertise and, and connections and resources. So please reach out, not just even in community gardens, but in many other ways. This is where, you know, you can get very creative here. Reach out to other community organizations. I mentioned the Autism Society of Florida. There are so many, um, you know, Metropolitan Ministries comes to mind. Um, Vincent's Academy comes to mind. The schools, obviously, many of them do have school gardens that we work with. I think those are excellent opportunities for some of maybe the, the FLIP programs, the future planner um, programs to help educate them on all the gardening and the horticulture and that kind of aspect of education. But what about over here on the design process and the planning and the engineering processes as well? There's a lot of educational opportunity that can be had there. It might take some work to look at and investigate land development codes. Are there ordinances that need to be put into place or changed, adapted in some way, zoning? What does the long range plan look like and how do you make sure to include these kind of spaces? Obviously, we need the roads, we need the homes, we need the businesses and the office buildings, the commercial spaces. We need the green spaces for the parks, we know that. But we need spaces like community gardens that provide more than just the nutrition, the education, the healthy aspects. This is a place for people to belong and to come together. 
I have people in some of our gardens that are homeless that use our gardens to grow their own food and they live, unfortunately, in the woods. I have one gentleman that lives six miles away from a community garden and he walks there pretty much every single day. He's not just there to grow food for himself, he volunteers to help other people with their plots of food as well. People from all aspects of the community can come together and feel belonging and become important and find ways to elevate themselves and lift out of their situation if they so desire. So it may take looking at some of these ordinances to allow for these kinds of spaces and planning for not just the current, but also the future while these spaces are there and, and keeping in mind that we can be unconventional. It can be behind a building. Um, you know, it can be off the side of the road if it's safe enough to do it. You can pretty much put them anywhere that um, the ground is safe. Even if you did have contaminated soil, you can go above ground in earth boxes and, and raised beds and whatnot. Do you have access to sunlight, full sun, and do you have access to clean water? It's pretty much what it boils down to for these kinds of spaces. We have them in urban, rural, and suburban environments. They apply absolutely everywhere. The other thing that you need to look at very seriously is building a coalition of supporters. Extension can certainly help do that, but those supporters are gonna obviously be administration within county government or city government, um, but they're gonna also be the folks that uh, provide the funds. And how do you show the value and the impact? What kind of key performance indicators are gonna get their attention? What is their strategic plan? Find the areas where community gardens can fit into that strategic plan, because I promise you they absolutely do. And I've given you just a few glimpses of how that can be, um, all the way from building healthier, more sustainable communities, all the way over to you know, how we, we uh, work around stormwater and, and resiliency planning for the future. So many different avenues here for community gardens. But you gotta build a coalition of supporters to get in there and say, we want these, we need these. And you're gonna have to have champions, funded positions, to be quite honest with you. Can community gardens make it on volunteerism alone? Yeah, they can. But I'll remind you, it's Florida and it's hot. <laughs> and people have lives and it's, it can get hard. And you do need people to come in that will sustain these programs. You have a lot of people that want to come in and get them started and then they go, okay, it's started, I've done my job and they leave. I have found that for them to be sustainable and highly successful, you need to have some funded positions that are there doing some of the education, networking with these folks, making them, helping them feel belong, like they belong, coming up with some of these creative projects but also just looking for problems and troubleshooting and picking up the phone and saying, I've seen you haven't been in your plot for the past week. What's going on? How can we help? Or, hey, you've got aphids over here. Here's how we can help with that. So you do need those funded positions, if at all possible. Um, and I think working with your, your government organizations to find that funding, and it doesn't have to be a lot, to be honest with you. You can do this for quite a small amount of money. Um, and once you start showing the value and the support based on those key performance indicators, the money and the support starts to come very, very quickly. It's easy. Community gardens are win, win, win all the way around in every aspect. So here is a, a photo of the wall. This is um, one of the kids actually wrote um, as part of his art project, all you need is love to grow healthy foods. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of finish um, in, in this spot just to show, I mean, it's a, it's a simple aspect here, but this was a child that is on the autism spectrum. It really did impact his life, changed his life in a lot of ways. And uh, as you notice there, he said, food makes me happy and makes me strong. And I think that's the case when it comes to our communities overall. It makes us healthy and it makes us stronger together. So, what I'm going to do um, right now, and there's my email if you, if you wanted to try to get a hold of me at any time, I'm going to um, jump out of here real quick. I'm going to stop sharing. Hold with me, please. 
and I am going to allow you to unmute yourself if you wish. So if you have any questions or comments, you can, you should be able to find where you can unmute yourself, probably the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You'll have a little microphone, it may have a little red line through it, just click on it and you'd be unmuted. We've still got about seven minutes here. Any comments? Any questions? Hopefully, Hi, Whitney, this is Amy. Yes. Um, one of the questions I had for you, I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, a little bit more about the ordinances for sure. uh, urban agriculture. Sure. We were really fortunate here in Pasco County years ago. I started working with um, uh, a planner here in Pasco um, that, that had a real good knowledge and sense of the local food system. And um, we were able to work together to develop a food policy advisory council and it's advisory council to the Board of County Commissioners. And out of that grew support and we worked hard. Um, lots of planners in Pasco County actually worked really hard to develop an urban ag ordinance which allowed for market gardens, community gardens in many different spaces throughout Pasco. And this may be something that needs to be investigated depending on your particular location and area, but it really was a game changer. Um, up until then, we weren't able to really start a community gardens program. That was just dead in the water. But with that ordinance, um, that changed everything and opened up all of these opportunities that we've been talking about today. And that would not have happened if it had not been for planning and some of those planners coming forward and talking with me about a partnership almost six years ago that that started. Um, so it's really, really important um, that, that you look at those types of things early on in the process if you're thinking of going this way. But, you know, obviously there's a process. Most of you guys are planners. You know that it takes work to get some things changed but it's certainly worth it. And it was quite easy to find support um, for changes in those ordinances and in our um, land development code. Whitney, Does that answer your question? Yes. I'm sorry. Can I ask you about the market gardens? Um, yes. We've allowed community gardens for, for a number of years in Pinellas County. We want to mm -hmm. encourage local governments to um, be able to allow small commercial gardens, but we're mm -hmm. finding with the Right to Farm Act it's uh, very limited on what local governments can do in terms of regulating those uses. Yes. So whenever, um, you know, and there was a, a new bill that came through last year, a new law that was passed that allowed for edible landscaping and all these kinds of things started kind of opening up. Um, Linda, if you'd like to, to give me a call and we can talk a little bit more about the market gardens we do have in our um, urban ag ordinance language specific to the market gardens and where those are allowed and how many vehicles can come in and out in a day and all of those kind of specific details there that might be able to help you um, in your discussions there with your your market gardens to be able to move forward because there you know there there were a lot of things we had to wiggle around to make that possible okay thank you so give me a call and we can we can talk more specifics on that for sure thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hey, Whitney. Uh, my yes. Name is John. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Good. This is an awesome presentation, by the Thank way. Thank you. But I work for a company called Real Building Consultants, and we have a partnership with a company called Whitwam Organics, and we actually um, design, build, and run community gardens all across Tampa Bay. Fantastic. Um, but with COVID, we really have seen a drop off in, in volunteers at pretty much all of our gardens. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you've seen the same, how you're combating that. Um, I just want to hear your, your thoughts on that. Honestly, I saw the exact opposite. Um, oddly enough, I, you know, I've had people calling saying, how can I become a volunteer? What, what can I do? Um, you know, we do utilize through the extension service. We have a lot of volunteers like our master gardener volunteer program. And I had a lot of those that were working um, in the gardens just as some of their projects and some of their service 
in the community. And the first few weeks, um, the university withdrew them and said, until we have a handle on how to keep them safe, we're gonna hold them back. They have since been allowed to come back into the gardens. We, have do, we do have specific um, ways and guidelines that we do that, but we found them to be very safe um, environments. People do wear masks. We do socially distance. Um, we do, um, and most of them, um, and we're, we're waiting on some equipment to provide hand washing stations, soap, hand sanitizer. We ask them to bring their own tools where they're not sharing tools. Um, but I've had a lot of people reach out asking to be involved because, um, and it may be because early on I was able to do some interviews. I think what helped with that, interviews with local media and it was right after I did a couple of those interviews that people called and said, how can I get out there? Because they recognized it was outside. It was some physical activity for them, some way to connect with somebody, even if they were 100 feet away from them, to have a little bit of a conversation. And this was relatively safe for them to be able to do. So I think the main thing is to get the word out, be able to share through your social media, share through um, you know interviews that you might be able to do that, hey, we're open for business, we're essential. These, these folks, you know, it involves food, we're essential workers, here's how we can keep you safe. I think it's also just about explaining here are the rules and reg regulations and they're designed to keep you safe. I do think you could get some folks in the community if you can let them know through various avenues, you know, what are the rules and that this is considered a relatively low risk um, activity to be doing. Um, we do limit the amount of people that are in the garden at a time. If it's necessary, typically it's not, you know, not everybody shows up same day, same time. Um, but um, we were very transparent about the fact that we understood that there were risks to, to people out in the public. And here were the steps we were going to take to keep them safe. And because of that, I think they do trust us. Um, you know, our reputation Fortunately, the University of Florida um, precedes us in many cases, and we take that very seriously, that responsibility. So I think any way you can convey to your volunteers of how you can keep them safe, but the benefits of them continuing to come and volunteer, um, I think is really what you've got to do and, and be very transparent in how you're going to keep them safe. Um, even if that's scheduling them yourself, I don't know how, how you're set up, but you might schedule them so they're staggered, they're not there at the same times. Um, you know, anything you could do to make them feel comfortable. But I actually, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that a lot of yours are attracted. I totally understand why, but luckily ours, we had people out of the general population saying, how can I help? And I think it was just a feeling of, I need to have some, something positive going on in my life and how can I do that? So, um, give them a plan of how you can keep them safe is what I would suggest to you. Will do. Thank you so much. Hope, I hope that helps uh, a uh, little bit. I mean, I have, I have, we have signs in our community gardens that, you know, about um, the, the guidelines and how to stay safe. We have those posted even. So, you know, um, we're, we're very cautious and we do communicate with our volunteers um, frequently as well. Um, so, you know, anything you can do to, to help them feel comfortable, I think will help. Great. And do you require masks in your gardens or um, more distancing? Right now, definitely social distancing. If they're there alone, we don't require masks right now, but if there's anybody else in the garden, we do. Okay. It's hard. It's hard. It's hot. And yeah. we get that. We totally get that. So, um, you know, um, like with our program assistants, uh, if they're out there and they're working, um, you know, and there's nobody else in the garden, we don't require them, but we do if there's anybody else. So we ask that they always have them handy um, and with them for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. I know we're, we're pretty much out of time here. It's just a little bit after three. I would like to say thank you to APA Suncoast section, Amy reaching out and setting this up and allowing us to get the word out about what we've been doing and some of the connections and community building that we've been able to do. It's been fantastic. It is well worth the, the effort um, on community gardening. So um, please feel free to reach out to me. 
um, at any time. Um, your local extension office, if you're not in Pasco County, if you're in Pinellas, Hillsborough, wherever you find yourself, you can find extension online. Just Google it um, or get with me and I'll give you the name. I know one of my, my colleagues was on here just a little bit, bit ago, so um, they're, they're probably waiting for your call. We'd be happy to help. So thank you all very much. Hope you appreciate it. Hope you, you enjoyed this afternoon. I appreciate your time. Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.